Good evening. Once again, welcome to the 24-hour New Writing New Normal International Theatre Festival. All of us here would like to welcome you. Uh, we will begin this evening with a play called When My Body Broke. When my body broke, I was sitting down. When my body broke, I was standing up. It was an ordinary evening, really. It was an ordinary day, really. We had just finished a late dinner. I'd had a bit too much wine, I suppose. But Peter doesn't drink, so he was always the one to drive. The restaurant was winding down. Peter was ready to go home and go to bed. The candles and the wine were making me feel warm and romantic. I wanted to take a moonlight drive around the lake. I was sitting at a coffee shop reading a book. It was very quiet in there with just a few people sitting around doing what I was doing or tapping away on their laptops or having quiet conversations. Every now and then you could hear the hiss of the espresso machine or the sound of ice jiggling in a glass. It was the kind of still and quiet day that I liked. The kind of still and quiet day that I had almost every day, I guess. So we got in the car and drove. It was such a beautiful night with the moon shining through the clouds. Everything looked so soft and harmless. The car would go up and down, up and down these small hills. You know, that giddy feeling you get in your stomach when you go up and down, like a roller coaster. Yeah, I love that feeling. I reached for Peter's hand, and the last thing I remember is the way it felt when he stroked my palm with his thumb. The sounds of shouting started to creep into the coffee shop. I looked out the window, but I didn't see anything unusual. The shouting was happening in a kind of rhythm, like a chant of some sort, and it got louder and louder, and suddenly it was all around echoing in the street. And then people began streaming in front of the window, gripping posters and banners, pumping their arms in the air, clapping their hands, a protest against the government, it turned out. Well, no, the last thing I remember is the bright light that suddenly shot through my window, and then the moon vanished. My first thought was, well, good for them, but I'm not a marcher. That just isn't how I deal with the world. And I went back to reading my book. When I opened my eyes, I had no idea where I was, but the pain was so intense that it jolted me into the present. A hospital. I was laying in a bed in a hospital. Well, they would tell me later that a car had run through a stoplight and had smashed right into the passenger side of our car. Yeah. Well, Peter was mostly unharmed except for some minor fractures and bruises. I had a broken arm and ribs and femur and some internal damage. They told me I was lucky to be alive. I didn't feel so lucky. As I sat there, I found I couldn't focus on my book. It felt silly, felt wrong. I started to think about my still and quiet days, all those hours spent sitting alone in a coffee shop reading a book. I started thinking about why I deal with the world the way that I do. It wasn't the first time I thought about this, but now I was staring out the window and watching the world go by, and it struck me in a different way. I laid in that hospital bed for weeks. For the first part, I was in and out of consciousness, and when I was conscious, I wanted to be unconscious. The pain was terrible, yes, but the worst part was staring out the window and thinking about everything out there that I was no longer going to be able to do. I was thinking, would the pain ever go away? Would I ever be able to walk normally? Would I be able to enjoy a moonlit drive around the lake ever again? I started thinking about all the ways that I've been told to sit down, all the ways I've been told to be a good girl and watch my mouth and sit with my legs crossed and behave. How my body should look how my body should feel, how my body should behave. And I looked down at my book 
and it just seemed to dangle in my hands like this utterly useless thing. And I wondered if I had become the same thing. It was the physical therapy that almost killed me. I had never worked so hard to achieve so little. It took me weeks to lift my arm. It took months to walk on my own two feet. All the simple things that my body used to do without even thinking, now I had to think about every little thing. It was as if my body were no longer mine. It was no longer my friend. It was this thing that I had to fight every minute of every day. There were days when I hated my body for the way it betrayed me. I was doing my best to make it better and sometimes it felt like it just wasn't interested in doing anything but making me and I don't know quite how one thing leads to another, but without thinking, I tucked my book into my bag and got up and joined the march. I didn't know what to do with my body at first, with my hands or my mouth. I felt embarrassed, like I didn't belong, like I was trying to be someone I wasn't. But being there with everyone else, I found some courage and I started to shout and I started to scream and I started to pump my fist in the air. I started to feel like I was inhabiting a different body, a body that was standing up for something. And in my own private way, I felt like I was standing up for myself. It felt like the first time I had ever done that. I used to go rock climbing, you know. It's how I met Peter actually. There was something about the challenge of climbing up the face of a rock that I loved. It was a physical challenge, of course. Like every muscle had to learn to do the right thing at the right time. Your foot had to find the right place. Your hand had to find the right place. And between the two, your whole body had to exert itself just the right way to keep your balance and to keep climbing. All the muscles had to work together. They had to speak to each other and listen to each other. When I was young, I went to ballet school. My parents thought it was a sort of proper and feminine way for a girl to get exercise and learn how to control her body. It was all about the line, all about the beauty, and all about the excruciating physical training. The ballet teacher would come in with her stick and poke at our bodies. I remember once she came in and poked me in my waist and told me that it looked like I had eaten ice cream the night before. I never felt so small and shrunken as when I entered that studio. But rock climbing is also a mental challenge because you have to concentrate. You have to tune out the fear of plunging into the abyss and you have to trust your body. You have to remove doubt, you have to remove fear. And during the worst moments, during my recovery from the accident, I tried to remember this. I tried to remember what my body could do. And I had to believe that my body could do it again. I had to know that my body was still there inside all those broken bits, all those parts that were scared. I was screaming because my body was screaming because it needed my help. I tried for years to forget the terror of ballet school. I had always thought that it had ruined me in some way. Made me hate my body, made me hate how I looked in the mirror, made me hate having people look at me. It had burrowed in my brain and taught me to follow the rules. It's no wonder I like to sit in coffee shops and read books and stay hidden away from the world. But the strange thing was, that I thought about ballet when I was marching. I was standing so straight and I felt like I was moving with such grace and power. Ballet had taught me how that feels. And here I was using that lesson to break the rules that I had always followed. And with time, my body got better. I got better. I can walk. I can do all the things I used to do. I, I can even, climb rocks. My body remembered. My body remembered everything. 
I still go to coffee shops. I still read books, but I do more things. I stand up for the things that matter to me. I speak my mind. My body taught me that. My body taught me to misbehave. When I was in the hospital, the morning light would stream into the window through the blinds and dapple the whole room. I hadn't appreciated it then, that warm healing light. But I think of it now as a kind of message that I would get through it, body and all. During that march, we passed these tall iron gates. They were like a symbol of the power to control. But the sunlight came right through the bars, spreading this amazing golden light over the whole crowd. It makes me think that our bodies aren't prisons. They're made to let the light through. And that's what happened. What happened when, when my, my body broke. Body broke. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The next play up is Lulu is in love. Yes, I know what it looks like. I shouldn't be snooping, but they say an internet browser tells more than a bedroom these days. And he's I really must stop doing that. They have gone to get supplies. We um rather needed some replenishing. Oh, a cam worker. Makes sense. This clearly wasn't their first time around the block or around a woman. So they didn't turn it on when we were that was all for us. <laughs> you rogue. No, they didn't. On their own demon time then. Interesting. Cardi B will be proud. Right. I'm going to log into my OnlyFans here and bookmark it there. For, you know, personal reasons. Not that I think I'll be sticking around. No, of course not but I need to tell someone. Hello, my babies. It's Lulu here. Look at me like that. I know you can all tell I got some. Don't be jealous. You've seen it all anyway. Are you really going to argue like that, Pierre? No, I thought not. Thank you for the donation, by the way. In all my time, rattling about the place, you get to be a little bit more particular, a bit more delicate. And it's only fun if you know you're being played with, right, babies? Looksies. If I should turn on their stream. <laughs> Surprise pervert. It's me, Lulu. You may kiss my ring. I can't help it. I need an audience. I always have. And I'm big enough to admit that. It's hard being a main character. Team, it really is. Holding the whole thing up by yourself. Being the name on the front cover and having that name be synonymous with sex ever after. I really know how Aphrodite and Cleopatra and Kate Moss feel. Frank based me on someone he knew, of course, but made me far more spectacular and shocking. He knew what his bread was when he buttered it, or rather that sex sells. 
even in 1895. So man created woman and made her horny as hell. The new ones are confused. Yes, I talk sometimes. It's not only tits 24 seven. You really haven't guessed yet. The Lulu, that Lulu. Or the sex plays, Lulu plays. Some of you are really not well read and it shows. The tragic sex, mad muse of Frank V, the kind of that little spring fling or what was it? Spring awakening, the tame one. I had two generations of men after me, a world famous painter, one of my fiancés paid to paint my picture, fell so in love with me, he told me he licked his paintbrushes nightly, the purr. Well, perhaps asking him to paint me with my lips apart was kind, especially when I didn't specify which lip cement, but still, he didn't have to chase me around the chaise lounge, did he? And when I finally put him out of his misery, he put himself out of his, just flat, forward on his face, no more. Heart gave out. Let's see, there was this jealous doctor that tried to give me the gun to atone for my sexy sins, which was stupid really, because I shot him, though his son didn't mind. I was called Eve by the next fellow. He thought I was the first woman, and then a woman, many women. Ah oh, yes, I've lived a life for someone who never existed. <laughs> Look, like clockwork, fans blowing up my phone, Lulu time. Good question. I get somewhere between two and three billion streams nightly. Sure, they won't mind. And there, there are my babies. Talk to me, love me. Hello. Yes, very perceptive of you. I'm not in my own room. Where do you think I am? Ah, oh, yes, see there. Look. First million one. That's a lot of Korean dosh. And I'm not even doing anything. It's just not that I don't appreciate it, all this love, but Frank did. What what Frank did, what you what he created was, it was like a, a superpower, a curse, a 100% success rate every time can be dull. But it was no use. The power of the imagination Frank had put me in, the idea I mean, a woman that causes men to keel over or take a razor at their throat with one word of rejection? She can't ever die. At first I was delighted and doted upon. As time progressed, so did my canine knowledge. Whatever, whichever, wherever, and don't say love. 
I got love too. But it all felt, well, it felt like it was cursing my name. I never felt love. No one remembers Frank. Not like they remember William Shakespeare or Marquez. They only ever remember me. And through magic or imagination or the damn cannon, honey, it decided I was going nowhere. I was stuck, part of literary history and contemporary present, ingenue forever. Hmm. Would you call me a succubus? Gary, just for that, you don't get privilege. I mean, I went to the library, of course. I knew there were more of us. Tragic, sexy heroines, slaves to our storylines. Kept expecting Lolita or Helen of Troy to be there, to pop up and have a tea morning. But nothing. And centuries of nothing. Men and women came and went in and out of my bed. And then, and then, friends, them, I wouldn't have missed their entrance for anything. Not female, not male, but the most exquisite eyeliner, rough leather jacket and fuck me heels. Lulu, there, again, friends, it happened again. No, not a hands-free handy, Roland. My heart, it beat. I get it. Van Gogh, Romeo and Juliet. Those poor souls who struggled alone under the weight of a beating heart. So heavy, so wet, and not in that way I'm used to. I have a desire to ink their name on my skin. Is that normal? The first time it happened, just once, this wet, heavy thump in my chest. I thought it was the base of the club, but, but it's them, friends. In all my years, in all my lovers, better than be holy trinity, amen. Nenemena, tell us a quarter pounder, and the brand of the virus, my Rafi. The Greek, you know, my own Greek deity, carved out of marble. So concludes this chapter of my never ending story, complete with a burger and a cuddle. Three clicks of my red stilettos, and I'm home. Bye, friends. Remember, don't go blind, or I'll take the pics down. Great. Thank you very much. The next play will be the play called Hung from a Star. Spy with my little eyes. Do, do, ray, do. But what didn't begin with that? 
his shit, me, the thought that came out of his wisdom, the wisdom of knowing when to put the clay aside and I wasn't finished. It never was finished, never meant to be finished. I'm sorry, Father. I'm sorry, great dear, that I was me. Time for dinner, I suppose. Nectar or ambrosia? I quite like the sound of a Coke. It makes a little sound. That's funny. Like it's alive. A drink to enliven you. Oh, how I need to be enlivened. A Coke and a popcorn, please. Oh, a large. Oh, definitely a large. I really wish I could ask that to someone and really taste them. <sighs> Ambrosia it is. Again. You used to be so filled with magic, it would spill out of you over the grasses or the sky, wherever we chose to go. We used to go to so many places, started so many worlds. Now I can barely glimpse them. I wish I knew what broke you. My chariot, a way to sail on a thousand seas and islands that we had made with pure unadulterated thought and love, with a magic that was so Enduring, except it didn't endure. I wish you would stop crying. I wish you would stop your tears. It's torture to hear you cry. Do you know the pain that it causes me? It's only me and you, you know. No one can hear us. I banged on the walls and the windows for a thousand years and no star even blinked. I'm sorry, you only did what I did. B, wasn't that the point? Wasn't that the aim to be, to make this infinite B? Separated from my Anu. Why wouldn't you support us? In the end you were so feeble when it mattered. My Anu, but you, Choked. So, we're here. Forced to watch the ever-repeating craziness and crazies on the stones that once were in my offering. These hands were made, were conceived to make, but also to guide. That's me to make, to shape, to guide. Shape. Hmm. Maybe I could shape you and change what's run out. Do you think that would work? Give you back your old spark so that we could move like we used to. The old team, me guiding and you splashing your magic power like rainbow rain over dead rock possibilities. Wouldn't you like the idea of having a second wind? I want to go again. I want to be again. I wish I had some amber shards. Or a sea dragon fan. No, a sea serpent tooth. Much more powerful. More cunning and more conviction in it. This steel blade will do. I'll be as gentle as I can. I'll make it quick. Perhaps there's another way. Perhaps I can... A fork is four times the pain and six times less the power. It has to be this. With no tooth, it has to be this. I'm sorry. Please, 
stop crying. You have to use the power. You have to let this in. Oh, it's no use if it doesn't hurt. I'm sorry. Anu, why didn't you give us a way to escape from here? I wonder if any of them remember us. Remember what we did. All those rocks given such harmony and now they scrabble like spiders in a cauldron trying to find a way out of the pots that I made. All of those worlds and creations left to their own devices. For what? They must be left in peace. They must journey through the path of the wills that they crave. Why? I could show them how happiness works. With thoughts and cogs and feelings to simmer on a low heat for four generations and avoid being burnt by bad recipes. It's cruel, pointless. I have to get out of this ship. We have to get out of this ship. There's another one. Bam, flash, boom, gone. Another crater filled of cross wires. And another one over there, 300 million strides away. Star fodder, eaten like a melting gobstopper. At least you can't move so you can't see this. Oh, at least you're still there, little earth. I remember I had a cold that day, but I couldn't pass you by. Bed rest would wait. Everything in you was so ready, so, so much potential, enthusiasm. Green and blue, so beautiful with the flecks of white. So warm, so bright. It's no good, Key. It's no good. They can't hear us rattling around in this cage. It's a wonder that they gave into any comforts at all. I wish they'd been more open. I wish they'd seen what else I had to give. All of these dead little earths, swall swallowed by stars, swallowed by their own idiocy, swallowed in hollowless black holes. Ooh. Endless, hungry, greedy things, awful things, marauding and removing, afraid to miss out on the taste of the next thing. Hmm. The mistake of not giving them taste buds, I guess. Hmm. Big mistake, duh. On the fix list, Anu. Maybe a black hole got you too. Huh. The tastiest treat of all. A plate of sageness served with a side of divinity, lip smackingly good, I'm sure. Come on, try me. Come on, see how we taste. See how mortal all immortals are. I can't bear to watch my green and blue turn to red or dry. So many smashed marbles, too many. Oh, hello. It's not all right. What do you think? Better than Ambrosia. <laughs>
Great. Thank you very much. The next play we'll be watching is Glorious. For years, I wanted a new body. I did. I'd get on my knees and pray for it. I would count rosaries over it. When we went to church, I didn't ask for world peace or goodwill for all. I said, God, please, can you change my body? I suppose everybody wants to change their body. Lengthen it, shorten it, make bits smaller, other bits larger. But for me, I wanted to change what was on the inside. I wanted to change my brain. I can't remember how old I was when I first noticed it, but I was with my sister and she was babysitting me and this boy came over and she warned me right there and then she said, don't be weird. I learned that being weird upset her, turned her cheekbones beetroot. Being weird made her cry at night. And my mum. I could hear her at night, kneeling on the floor, praying to God, Lord, please cure Angela of her weirdness. I felt sorry for her, for her pain, for her embarrassment. And so at night I would go to my room and I'd pray to God too. I'd say, please, Lord, don't let me be strange. I fell over quite a bit in those days. My sister would say I have legs of jelly. Suddenly, for no reason, I would just fall over. I'd give way. I'd bang into people. And if someone said hello, or if someone asked me a question, it was just terrible. I couldn't speak. It was like this tidal wave would come over me that drowned out all the answers before I could get to them. And I couldn't work out people. You know, their bodies, their faces, just so, so contradictory. I couldn't understand why people smiled when they were sad or why they nodded when they disagreed or why they said they were fine when they clearly weren't or why they lied <laughs> all the time from the morning to the evening. You see, I could read their hearts. My grandma said that was my gift. You can see through people, can't you? And I could. When people came up to me, I could feel what they were feeling. I knew what was in their hearts. It's like we were linked, like some sort of secret traveling through the air from them to me. And I saw how they pretended. And not just people. I could see the hearts of animals too. And trees. It's like everything in the world was always speaking. And I could hear it all. My sister would explain to everyone we met that my brain was a little dud. And I found out that people didn't want to touch me in case my weirdness was contagious. Teachers and other mothers. I was never invited to the parties in case I gave it to the other children. The strangeness. In case I somehow made their brains dud too. <laughs> my mother took me on pilgrimages. Lords. Rome. She got the Pope to touch me. <laughs> holy men and unholy men all promised they could change the inside. But the inside stayed exactly the same. And as I grew older, I could hear that word again. Strange. But this time, it was from the boys who avoided me completely who didn't invite me to the dances. And it was from the companies when I applied and they sent back the letters just saying no. My grandma was the only one who didn't think I was a dud. She said it was lovely. She said, most people spend their lives trying to get rid of the bad bits, trying to get rid of the rage, the anger and the pain. But not you, you don't do that. You're lucky. 
<clears throat> I didn't feel lucky. Finally, um, she got me this job in a cafe. The owner liked my name. Okay, Angel, I'm going to put you in charge of the cakes. Is that all right? So I was the cake lady. That was my job. And every day there would be this boy who would come in and sit right by the window. He would always order one Americano and a Victoria sponge. And he'd just sit there and draw everything. The traffic, people. I said, you can have one if you like. And then one day he did me a drawing. It was astonishing. Just the detail, the beauty. I wondered how he'd done it. And he said, his brain works differently. He can see a person once and commit it to memory. And it was a beautiful picture. I kept it in my pocket like a little bit of treasure. And I took it home and I showed my mother and my sister who said, you can stop that, whatever that is. But I didn't want to stop it. I hoped and prayed it would carry on. But my sister said, you should go back and tell him. Tell him what's wrong with you. He has a right to know, she said. So I did tell him. And he drew me, drew me four more pictures. He just smiled. He said it doesn't matter. And no one had said that to me before. That the strangeness doesn't matter. And as he was leaving one day, he said, do you reckon one day we could go out? <laughs> I wasn't sure. I said, sometimes I'm clumsy. Sometimes I can't speak. Sometimes I don't get the words right. I, because, you know, my brain is a bit different. And he just said, well, your heart's good, right? And I said, yes, that part's all right. And he said, well, that's enough. Because he said, I would really like this to be the start of something. And no one had ever wanted to start something. <laughs> All the voices in my head just said, no, like an almighty chorus. But I did it anyway. I went out with him that day. And then the next day. And then the next. <laughs> and uh, this year, it will be five years. I used to feel so ashamed. God, I used to feel like I was a problem, like a dilemma. But these days I don't. Nope. These days I feel, well, <laughs> bloody glorious. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes tonight's performance. I could ask all the actors and directors and playwrights to uh, unmute themselves and to turn on their video so we can get a round of applause to everybody. That would be wonderful. So I'll just, there we are. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you back in July. So. Good night, and thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye.